I don't think an in-memory event bus is a good idea. Typically, you'd see it being used to publish domain events to other parts of your domain to let it know that something has occurred, and this would all be done in process. If you're in the .NET space, an example of this is the Mediator library. I'm going to explain the pros and cons and why I think the downsides far outweigh the benefits. Hey everybody, it's Derek Colmartin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design, so if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So first, what am I talking about an in-memory event bus? It's just having our producer and consumers executed within the same process using the same memory. That means that we still have our decoupling of producers and consumers. So when something occurs, we produce a message, an event, and then we have different consumers consume it and everything is completely decoupled. So that means we have our producer, maybe it sends a request to this library, this in-memory event bus that we're using, or maybe we've developed one ourselves. Either way, we have it execute. The bus knows who's registered and wants to consume that event. It can then invoke that consumer and then it will invoke another consumer. Now these could be done serially, they could be done in parallel, but regardless, we're all within the same process. So we don't go all the way back up to our producer until all our consumers have executed. So I mentioned domain events and that's probably the primary use case that I see where it's advocated of using an in-memory event bus. And this is because we can leverage the same instance types through the producer and the consumer. So as an example, let's say we have a producer where it's a command handler, it's performing some operation where it then has to make some state change to our database. And we've started a transaction. At that point, we have our transaction open, we've made state changes, but we wanna have other parts of our system um, react and consume this event that we're about to publish. But those things can actually leverage that same transaction. So when we have our producer publish that event and then it executes the event handler. It can then leverage the, the underlying type that has that transaction. And now here's the thing is that the event handler doesn't know that it has a wrapped transaction. It's just executing its code as normal. So maybe it makes a state change. And then the same thing can happen for the other event handler. Now that means because we're in process, if this other event handler executes and there's a failure, that underlying transaction, which started by the producer and the other event handler used, even though it was unaware of it, that entire transaction could roll back. That means that initial request that we made from the producer, maybe it was adding some new records to our database, that would roll back. The entire thing would roll back. So what could be the problem with that? It actually sounds pretty nice that be able to have everything succeed or fail together. The problem is you're losing the point of this loose coupling. You want to be able to produce a message and have another part of your system react to it and react to it in isolation. It doesn't need to be concerned or have to know when you're looking at that code, okay, if this fails for whatever reason, um, how is that affecting the producer? You don't want to think about this. It's kind of the developer experience of when you add new consumers, which you can at any time, you don't want to be thinking about how it's going to react to other consumers or other producers. You're going to have to create a lot of your own error handling logic per, per producer and consumer if you're doing things in memory. Let me show some examples here. So this example is using the eShop on web sample application. I made a little bit of a change to it. It was already using the mediator library, which supports publishing notifications, which are like events and everything done in memory. So when we create our order here and we're persisting that to our database, I'm creating an order placed event and I'm publishing it with mediator. Now I have two consumers. The first consumer is creating a shipping label. So it's reaching out, it's using my FedEx client to create a shipment so it can get back a tracking number from the shipping label. And then we're updating our order with that shipping, that tracking information. Now, like just I was mentioning, the way I have DI set up and registrations, that's that it's gonna be using the underlying same transaction. Now I have another consumer that is of course sending out a email order confirmation like you typically expect when you place an order. So I have two consumers, what could go wrong? One's creating a shipping label, hitting FedEx, and the other is sending an email. Seems pretty straightforward. So I'm gonna run the app here. I'm gonna go through the checkout process. Oh great, we created our order, no big deal. Let's create another order. I've behind the scenes made this fail periodically. So I'm gonna place an order now, and guess what just happened? We have a failure. 
So yikes, failed to create the shipping label. So this could be because of various re reasons where we have to reach out over the network, likely through some API for a FedEx client to create this shipment, and there was a failure on FedEx's end. So we didn't create our order, we didn't create the shipping label, we didn't send the email, or did we, depending on the order of operation there, but the point being here is that because everything's in process, how we, we have handle failures has to be specific for each different consumer. So the easy answer is, well, maybe we should just add some retry logic. So I've added poly, I've created a policy for wait and retry. So after each different failure, we'll wait some interval. And then I'm doing to do that three times. That should cover it. Just add some retry logic. So I'm running the app again. I'm gonna go through the checkout process. I have it configured behind the scenes so the first one will actually work, but then the second time is what is actually is gonna have the failure like last time. So we're checking out, we're hitting pay now. And then here's our exception behind the scenes that I was causing this, but we can see if I continue through it, we actually do succeed because we have that retry logic. So let's place another order because at this point, the third checkout process, I'm actually failing with the email. So here's a failure again, but we're gonna retry, no big deal but now our email's actually failing and we don't have any retry logic around that. So we're getting exceptions now, the same type of thing. We're failing to send the email because there was some type of failure, who knows what it is. And because we have that transaction, we can just roll back the entire thing. So you might be thinking, okay, I still don't get this. What's the big deal? Isn't that good that we rolled back everything? In the real world here, no, not at all. This is not a good thing. We don't want to have email availability issues or whatever is caused by email being down stop us from actually accepting and placing an order in our system. We want to accept the order. We don't want to lose that money. We don't want to lose that order that somebody's uh, trying to place just because we can't email out their confirmation. The email itself should naturally be asynchronous. If it happens in three, five, ten minutes from now, their email confirmation, that's totally acceptable. That shouldn't prevent us from actually placing an order. And this is the primary reason why I don't think an in-memory event bus is a good idea, is because you don't want everything generally to fail or succeed together. When I was mentioning the developer experience, I wanna be able to create a consumer at will for whatever new use case I have and not worry about the other consumers that I may affect if I have a failure or the producer itself if I have a failure. I wanna work, I want this code to execute in isolation. This means moving from in process to out of process. So when we initially created that order and we saved it to our database, at that point, we're gonna have our producer uh, publish that order placed event, and that's gonna be stored to some durable storage. At that point, we've placed our order, we're done. It could be the exact same process. It could be another instance, but it could be the exact same process that then picks that up out of storage and executes each consumer that needs to consume that message independently. That means if we have a failure for one consumer, that's independent of our original producer and it's independent of any other consumer consuming that message. So we have our failure, no big deal. Maybe we have again that second consumer that needs to consume it. It consumes it totally fine. Say it was creating the shipping label. But more often, we're in whatever library you're using for this, for a task queue, a messaging library, it's going to have things like retries built into it and different mechanisms for handling that. So it's not like you have to write your own poly logic like I had before for that policy. You don't have to worry about that. It's generally provided by the library you're using. So that retry automatically built in, then tries to execute that second consumer or technically the first one again, and that succeeds and we're done. So what I've added is Hangfire, which is essentially a task queue, which provides the retries. It provides external storage via Redis or SQL Server, et cetera. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the checkout process again place our order and everything worked. Well, not exactly really, because if I look at our email, our email is indeed actually failing, but everything worked fine. Seemingly, we were able to place our order. If we jump over to Hangfire's dashboard, we can see that we have this job that's actually that was failing. We can see actual our failure here, and we'll go through its default retry routine, but we are still able to accept our order. I'm only still using actually one process, but I moved it out of process because we're not, that initial request isn't the one actually executing the email and Hangfire is doing that for us, which is storing that message externally and then retrieving it again. And then I just hit my retry again. So we can see it will continue to retry until it succeeds. The primary benefit of using an in-memory bus is exactly that, it's being in memory, which is also the biggest drawback. 
If you wanna be able to leverage the underlying types, like I mentioned, a database transaction, this could be good. The problem is once you really start leveraging the publish subscribe pattern, you'll realize that you don't wanna have consumers affect other consumers or the producer. You want them to be independent. You wanna decide per consumer how it should handle failures. Each consumer, depending on what it does, will have a different strategy for handling failures. So you want them to be independent. Now, as mentioned, just because you're moving it out of process doesn't mean that it actually has to be a separate process that's doing that execution. It can still be designed in a way that you're moving the message out of process to the durable storage, but it's the exact same process that's actually executing it. You're just separating the publishers and the consumers from executing together. If you found this video helpful and you want to talk with other software developers about software architecture and design, make sure to join my channel where you can get access to a private Discord server. Check the links in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.